Hi everyone, this sermon is for Sunday, June 23rd, 2019. It is Pride Sunday here in Toronto, so happy Pride to you all. Our reading for today is taken from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 to 15a. And basically, it's about the worst day of the prophet Elijah's life. Poor Elijah. In today's reading, we have a snapshot of the prophet Elijah at the end of his rope. He's depressed. He's on the run. He's suicidal. He's collapsed under a tree in the wilderness, and he said, that's it. It's all just too much for me. I'm done, and he waited to die. If we could pan out to the rest of Elijah's story, you'd see that Elijah's current state is a dramatic shift of events. In the chapters just preceding this reading, Elijah is a superstar. He's a hero. He is larger than life. He's faithful, he's confident, he's on top of his game. When he prays, miracles happen. Upon request, he can raise the dead. In a ministry showdown, he rained fire down from the heavens upon his opponents. He even, it says, it, he even outran Arab's chariot for 17 miles. So Elijah's the man, right? There's no one greater than Elijah at this point. And you can bet that if the people threw a parade for Elijah, that it would just be as loud and celebratory as the recent one for the Toronto Raptors. So what gives? Why has our hero given up hope? Elijah followed Yahweh, whom he believed to be the one true God. Other people living in the area, specifically the Canaanites, they worshipped the god Baal, who was to them the god of all life and fertility. At the beginning of our reading today, we heard that Elijah, in his zeal to establish Yahweh's dominance, had killed off all the prophets of Baal. And let's set aside any questions we have about that, whether it's right or it's wrong, uh, because the Old Testament God of Yahweh is very different from Jesus' understanding of a loving God, whom he called Father. And the morality of Elijah's actions is not what I really wanted to highlight today. So the basic gist of the story is this. Queen Jezebel, who was Queen of Israel, she worshipped the God Baal. She was understandably upset when Elijah, that Elijah just killed off all her prophets and priests, and historic record shows that that might have been about 400 people. Queen Jezebel vowed revenge, so Elijah fled in the night, and he went to the land of Judah, where he'd be safe and out of reach from the queen's soldiers and the price on his head. But, oddly, Elijah doesn't just settle down in the land of Judah and start over. Instead, he walks out into the barren wilderness without any water or provisions. He collapses under a scraggly tree and expects to die soon. So what's he suffering from? Is it burnout? Is it a guilty conscience? When Elijah moans and he says, I am no better than my ancestors, perhaps he's meaning that he has befallen the fate of all the other prophets who have come before him. He's despised and rejected for all that he's done and for proclaiming the name of God. Perhaps he just can't take Queen Jezebel's fury and rejection. Fatigue, burnout, abandonment, anxiety, depression, grief. Although hailed as a Jewish hero, Elijah is human and has to deal with the same difficult feelings that most of us face at least sometimes in our lives, if not fairly regularly in our lives. To feel overwhelmed and sometimes like a failure is just part of the human condition. Those of you who have studied business and leadership know that setbacks and even outright failure are often the precursors to a breakthrough or something really, really good happening. Let's take a look at what some famous people have said about failing. President John F. Kennedy. Those who dare to fail miserably can achieve greatly. Author J.K. Rowling, failure is so important. We speak about success all the time, but it is our ability to resist and use that failure that often leads to our greater success. Researcher Brene Brown, there is no innovation and no creativity without failure, period. Entrepreneur Jenny Fleiss, embrace failure. Missteps and roadblocks are inevitable, but are ultimately an opportunity to learn, 
pivot and go after your goals with a new perspective. Just for argument's sake, let's say that Elijah had a life coach who encouraged him not to think about his life in terms of success and failure. Let's say, and let's say that he was also uh, an every cloud has a silver lining kind of guy. So let's say that he viewed his setbacks as stepping stones to success. So why then was he despondent in the desert? Maybe it was because he was all alone in his suffering. He had neither wife, nor friend, nor follower with him. He was alone in his misery and with all those negative thoughts that were running through his head. He had no one upon which he could lean when the going got tough. You'll notice that God didn't respond to Elijah's misery by simply just killing Queen Jezebel and eliminating the threat of punishment. Instead, God met Elijah where he was. He sent an angel to care for him and to see to his basic needs. Here, Elijah, have some delicious, freshly baked bread. Here, Elijah, have a drink with this cool, clear water. Elijah, it's time to look after you. God didn't say that everything was going to be hunky-dory from now on, or that Elijah would never have to struggle again. In fact, the angel told Elijah that he still had quite a journey ahead of him. But I think the angel's calming presence and kind offers of help gave Elijah the strength to move on. God invited Elijah to travel to Horeb, which we now know as Mount Sinai. This is the place where Moses had a direct experience with God. Once Elijah got there, he too encountered God, though not in the expected ways of a great wind or an earthquake or a fire. Instead, Elijah experienced a gentle God who spoke so softly that it was like a hushed sound or even the sound of fine silence. Imagine what that would be like. This is what the King James Version of the Bible calls the still, small voice of God. And just as an afterwards to this chapter in Elijah's story, once Elijah spoke with God, received his instructions about what to do next, and he hit the road, Elijah met Elisha, who became his most loyal follower and eventual successor. Never again was Elijah alone in his ministry. A few important things stand out for me in Elijah's story. Number one, everyone experiences hardship. Even if you're a prophet or you're daily trying to follow the way, there are days which are gonna suck and sometimes they suck big time. At times you're gonna feel overwhelmed, undersupported, overburdened and underappreciated. As the band REM said, everybody hurts sometimes. Try to remember that. Try not to take it personally because it's all part of being human. Number two, in this story, God doesn't swoop in and rescue Elijah. Instead, God comforts Elijah by being present with him. Through the actions of the angel, through their encounter on Mount Sinai, and by the gift of bringing Elisha into his life. God's response to Elijah's despair and estrangement is to infuse his life with the blessing of caring community and friends. Number three, a gentle reminder of how our gentle actions can sometimes speak much more loudly than words. When God spoke to Elijah, he didn't do it through the frightening power of a whirlwind, an earthquake, or a fire. It was in a voice so low so gentle, so vulnerable, so open, that it was less than a whisper, and yet somehow it was more than enough. Never underestimate the power of a kind word or even a look. Just our very presence, even when we can't think of a single thing to say, can offer someone comfort, much more if we approach that person with kind-hearted tenderness. For those of us who like to fix things, for those of us who are much more comfortable with doing and taking action, sometimes we have to rein all of that in. <laughs> Often it's far more effective to just quietly sit with someone as they experience their despair or hurt 
or loss. And the good news is, is that you don't need any special skills to do that. That's something that we can all offer to one another when the going gets tough. And the really good news is that God is doing this for us all the time. As God met Elijah in the silence, so is God waiting for us there too. No matter if you're dealing with a broken promise, a broken heart, broken bones, or a broken dream, God is not leaving us alone in our brokenness. God nourishes us and encourages us to keep moving, to keep going forward in our living, loving, envisioning, and becoming. Remember that in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, not because loss and grief are somehow good, but because God will always meet us in the darkness. We are never alone. Blessed be always and amen. <laughs>